In this video, I'm going to uh, show you guys a few examples and um, include some books on colonial wrought iron lighting devices. It's an area that's such a niche market and there isn't a lot of uh, resources out there. So I'm going to show you some examples from my collection and how you can identify if pieces have been replaced or you know, I'll show you some examples of uh, modern replicas and some forgeries. And, um, you know, I do like some replicas because it's a great way to get a nice piece that's typical of the 1700s, yet less expensive. Plus, the early pieces can be a daunting task trying to find. And I'm also going to go through and show you what I think is the best reference on early lighting. Now, there are various types of early lighting. You have candlesticks, and based on the style, you know, if they're brass ones, you can you'll know which um, like decade they came from in the 16 and 1700s. You have pewter, um, copper, brass, but, well, I already mentioned brass, but I like to focus on the rustic primitive style of lighting that's made with wrought iron because they just look so cool. These lamps are known as gimbaled whale oil lanterns. I was fortunate to find nice iron hooks to hang these to. This one I could always treat with linseed oil. Now, this one here has been restored. It was all fragmented, and the lamp dealer, he basically assembled it. I was hoping he would have sold it to me when he first mentioned it to me in pieces so I can enjoy assembling it. But if you look at this one here that's um, mostly all original, and I'll explain that in a moment, this is thicker than this, and you can see here how there's a... Uh, modern uh, piece of metal holding it. But if you look on the other side, also, um, here I need to uh, turn this a little more. If you look over here, I don't want to mess with it because it is shedding. You know, if you di some people like to dip and preserve these in hot wax. I prefer the linseed oil method, which is more um, of what they used to use to preserve metal centuries ago. You can see how this has been assembled and riveted, and the metal is a lot thinner than this one here. Now, this is the kind of pin that these would come with, and when you look at it, um, basically it's designed to stay level on a ship. These typically seem to come out of England, and they're from like the early 1800s. Now, this one here, you can see how these have been replaced by more modern nails, so this one has been... Um, repaired at one point, but it's still a beautiful museum quality piece. Whereas this one here, whoops, okay, whereas this one here, um, you know, a lot of it, like at least these two pieces are replacements, or all these rings are replacements. Now, this one here, on this side, is actually a uh, fake one I bought off eBay. So you can always buy uh, fakes on there, and sometimes you can find good prices on originals because a lot of people, they don't understand lamps. They don't know what they have, so either you get a really good purchase or you get ripped off because they think they have something that they don't. So that is something to keep in mind. Um, but if you notice, it has a thin metal, and these rivets are tiny, they're, they're not right. And, you know, this hinge is being held by a nail. And as opposed to this type of, type of hinge here, this is clearly done by an amateur forger. You know, and I've seen some like these. Some may be original, I'm not sure, but they'll hold a candle on the inside instead of a gimbaled whale oil lantern. Then you have the kind which you can put an open flame in, like what you see in the background in some scenes on the TV show Vikings. And um, these also came not in small, medium, but they also came in large. And I have a couple large ones, which I'm not going to um, show just because it would be a pain to pull them out at the moment. But uh, these are known as gimbaled whale oil lanterns. And there isn't a lot of information on the style, even in lighting books. Here we have an early 1700s Welsh rush light. Sometimes people refer to them as rush nips or rush light holders. And this one basically had the kind that stuck in a wooden base 
a lot of times these bases would rot away and they'd be replaced. And um, it's, you know, atypical to find one with the original base. Now, the twisted stem is an earlier style. And this curl like this, known as a monkey tail, is a weight to keep this closed. And when you see this style, it's typically Welsh. Some of these had the stem that came horizontal with a weight, like a little metal block on them. And later ones had a candle holder. Now, the candle holder style started out as more of a cone, and that was really not initially to hold a candle. I mean, you have a light here, you know, it defeats the purpose. If you had, could afford a candle, you wouldn't use rushes because um, candles were more expensive back in the day. So when the rushes or the rush lights burned into small pieces, they would use them to snuff them out. So a lot of people say, oh, those were candle holders, but they did not start out that way. And based on the style, you know, you can tell if it was an earlier one or not. Unfortunately, I don't have any with those to show you, but if you look online, you'll find plenty. Now, the rush was typically made of Juncus effusus, and what they would do is take the stems, dry them out, scrape off the, or peel out the exterior. They would put it in a grisset under the fireplace so all the grease would drip from what you were cooking. Soak up in here, and then that's what you would use as your fuel source. And they would be hung at a 45 degree angle and would typically, depending on the length, if they were a little over two feet, would last you roughly an hour or so. This one here is a replica made by Jerry Darnell or a modern uh, version of a splint lamp or also known as Pierman. Looks like a little tuning fork and you would take splints of wood soaked in grease and you would use that to light. And um, this one is also stuck in a base of wood and made to look uh, rustic. Now these didn't always come in bases. Sometimes you found them with three legs the Irish kind had the metal ring on the ground that came down, so that's how you know that kind came from Ireland. Now, this is a very unusual piece. It's made also by Jerry Darnell. And there's something called an alpine candle holder. And they basically were a little, the top was a little bigger, where you put something bigger like a candle, or this one was designed to hold rush or splint or something called a uh, fur candle, where the Scandinavian countries would take a piece of fur, and as it dried out, the resin would um, aggregate on the inside, and then they would hold it, stick it in those vertically, and light. It gave you a good flame, but it didn't last as long as like a rush or something. And I don't have one to show you, but sometimes they came with like a little tray to collect any drippings and things. Um, now, why do I have a lamp on the far right? This was initially a blacksmith tool that somebody had changed into a rush light holder or you could put a candle or something. I bought it off eBay because I thought it looked really cool and it was really rusted. So I soaked it in water with vinegar to remove the rust and then I coated it in linseed oil. Linseed oil is a good way to protect it. And if you take linseed oil, turpentine, and wax, like a roughly a third of each, maybe a little less wax, and you heat it up so it's molten and all mixed together, and then you heat the metal up, and then you coat it in that, then the wax will help seal it, and the linseed oil and turpentine will help uh, preserve it. And that's a way you can um, preserve your metal in a nice fashion versus just linseed oil or soaking it in hot wax. And I took a candelabra base and scraped it to fit it in here. This was still rusted. I couldn't open it. And it was really tricky to make into a lamp. I do need a bigger light bulb than this tiny one here. But anyway, it's a way to take an old antique that's been modified from a blacksmith tool into a light and then modernize it by electrifying it, all without ruining the originality of the piece. Here we have three spike candle holders. Now, one thing that I uh, forgot to mention with the rush lights is they actually had candle holders and rush lights and even the splint lamp pyramids. 
that hung like a pendant where you had this hook that hung on something, and extensions sometimes associated with a sawtooth trammel or a different kind of trammel. And then you had them extend out and you had so many fancy designs. Unfortunately, I don't have any of those kinds in my collection. Now you have these with three um, swivels. You also have them with five. Those are more expensive. And these were hung in barns and mines and everything. Now here I have one that just had one swivel. And it, the blacksmith even put a little stop in there, so that's kind of nice. And if you look at the edge, you can see the seam where they, the skill of the blacksmith, where they welded two thinner sheets of metal together. So it's very, um, very well made here. You can see it again right there. It's a very well made piece. Now, one thing to note is if you look at this candle cup, it's around five eighths of an inch. You look at this one, it's bigger. These five eighth inch candle cups, when you find those, these typically came out of Europe. The larger one, you know, most likely the Americas. Now this one here is a replica by Jerry Darnell. And it's actually modeled after one, I think it's page 92, I think I wrote it on here, yeah, page 92 of a book that features the Sorber collection, which was the largest collection of American um, wrought iron ever amassed. And some of these actually had the stub that came out, so when you hammered, you didn't bend this in. So this is a modern replica of one of those candle holders. This is a style of candlestick that came from the 1700s. But from what I understand, this example I have in my collection, it's a replica from like the 20s or so. And they usually have two of these, one on each end. Mine does not. It's kind of odd and quite, I guess, rare to be that way compared to, to supporting two candlesticks. You know, if you had a thing to snuff out the flame, you could hang it here. And what's nice is these are like leaf springs. So you can actually, let me use both hands. You can actually adjust the height on them. So these are really nice statement pieces and um, quite a beautiful piece of furniture for the home as well. This is a modern blacksmith made candle holders. Sometimes you had candle holders that were spikes that stuck into a piece of wood. The blacksmith didn't make the stem long enough and you can see how um, the workmanship is so different, different and atypical from other than the twist from what you would find in the 1700s. So you have a lot of modern replicas but when you make a piece that looks like the old one it's a great way to uh, corrosion wax. Um, it's a great way to get a piece that's authentic yet not antique so you can save a little money that way because some of those original pieces are really expensive unless you find someone who puts buy it now on ebay and doesn't know what they have and you luck out and it is not a fake here is a selection of cruise lamps now of all these this one is most likely the earliest if you notice how the saucer is like a triangle shape, it has a beautiful halberd hook. But um, the triangular shaped ones are typically indicative of England or Scotland. Now, when, you, when it comes to cruise lamps, you typically find the um, double valve. This would be a single valve cruise lamp. And this piece here, if you had like a ram's horn and the triangular shape, those are typically from the 1600s. If you had a more similar shape to this with the ram's horn, those would be um, 1700s and those would be Scottish when you see that kind. Now this is a beautiful example that my aunt found for me and gave to me that um, from Cape Cod. Now, the fact that you have a slot here that the top burner hangs in it's sometimes known as a slot lamp, but these are also known as Phoebe lamps. So they're known as double cruise lamps, slut lamps, slot lamps, Phoebe lamps, whatever you want to call it. Now, the reason why they moved from the 
single valve cruise lamp to a double valve or Phoebe lamp is because you would put the grease at the top and the wick and then it would drip and fall into the lower one and from there you can dump it back in here and reuse versus this one it drips it messes up your uh, fine uh, floor you know back then i guess you had persian rugs maybe not but um unless you were an importer in the col colonial era and um you would lose all that precious grease which you could have recycled and made into more lighting now this one is one I bought years ago off eBay, and if you notice, here you have a nail that's been beautifully bent, so this halberd hook and that piece are replacements, so the old ones wore out, and they replaced them with that, so it's still nice and decorative, versus this Kentucky-style cruise lamp, where it hasn't been replaced with other pieces and you can see how it's been extensively used and even plugged up where you had the hole and it was plugged up. This style of cruise lamp, um, these were used in the Americas all the way in rural areas up until the 1930s because some areas, um, it took a while to get electricity and they were poorer areas. Now this one here is really interesting because it has a um, lid to hold the wick in place and it has an interesting looking hook on it versus the typical um, halbert hook you would see on the cruise lamps this one here is a rusty one and if you notice it has a nail and this it seems to be a uh, you know this looks like it was stamped out i don't know if they ever did stamp them out um, back in the 1800s if this is a later style because you see these a lot or if it's a uh, forgery now this one, I'm pretty sure, is more fake. This one, you can tell, like, the slot, it's not perfectly straight, so it most likely is a forgery. But um, still, as a forgery, they're nice pieces, although they wouldn't cost you over $100. This one, what's nice is it's designed with a wick pick, so you would adjust the pick. But if you notice, this black patina doesn't look... Um, like a natural black patina. This halberd hook looks like it was a sheet of metal that was formed and twisted, not really as nicely as the other ones or as thick. So this one here clearly is a uh, nice example of a fake, but what's nice is it's complete with the wick pick, whereas the other ones don't have it. Now, let me start with this one before I go into that one. This is a... Um, four wick cruise lamp ironically the first clay oil lamps that were not saucers where they actually dedicated to oil lamps were four wick ones and from like 4,000 plus years ago or 3,500 or plus actually because they made them up until around 3,500 years ago I have a nice example which I won't show you in this video so anyway these this style here is typically from the early 1700s and it has a nice spike so you can spike it this way and it can hang or you can spike it in the ceiling you know ceilings were pretty low back then because people were pretty short um, and you can see how it connects to it versus using a nail like they do in modern times when they try to restore them poorly or um, make forgeries or cut corners now this one here you know this was the early 1700s this would be from the late 1600s and more Germanic and European in style. I actually have a book which shows the same design on the stem. It's just a beautiful piece and I didn't realize it was that old when I initially bought it. So naturally the these two pieces look like they could be replaced whereas on this one it could be original. But also this is nice because it swivels from side to side and this way so it was designed to be on a ship so you can see how it's designed with a little oval so it can stay side to side i mean it's just a, not the best condition but just a really nice early example of a four valve or four wick cruise lamp and i forgot one more oops now this one here 
is a beautiful example of a um, four-wick cruise lamp. And I think I may have paid too much for this one because it's really well made except for the stem being in the middle, you know, slightly offset. I think this is a really good version of a replica, but I'm not really sure because if you look at the metal, it's quite pitted, so it could have been one that has been restored. I just don't know. Someone could have added this and then added these, and you know, if it did have a swivel like this, um, they could they did a really good job fixing it up. Um, I just don't know with this one, and um, but obviously this piece here is most likely replaced to um, fix this. So this is one example. I don't know if it's been restored or if it is. Um, a modern um, replica but it's still a beautiful example and just how this one has um, a piece of metal that coils around this one does too only it's more defined so that could be also modern um, um, piece but whether it's um, early or modern it's quite interesting how each one is different in the technology they use in the design like this one has just a simple hook and like chain and everything whereas this one has a nice extension unfortunately on this one and that one they're missing but um they're just uh, beautiful pieces whether they're early or not and they uh, help complement an early collection now we get to betty lamps some people believe that the word betty may be derived, derived from the German for better. And um, basically, unlike the even the Phoebe lamp, they typically had a uh, channel which you put the wick in. So any grease would drip back into the pan and you didn't have to take it and refill it up, you know? And this is a really rough uh, example of when you can see how it's even bent and everything, but um, they... Uh, it's still, you know, at least a good example to show you for illustrating the purpose. This had a hinge to open and close. This one had the slot that would slide and you can see where someone soldered it, but you can see an old wick still in the channel. And this um, piece, if you notice the patina is different, this might be tin versus iron, but this looks like it may have been replaced at one time. Now, let me um, get these out of the way. To show you these this one here is cast iron and it's very beefy see how these are more delicate and this one's beefier this was basically a miner's lamp most likely french or german and you see the decorative thing here now when you see the hook come out and crook like that that's called a miner's hook and what's nice is this had a slot that you open to fill up the grease and then you put the wick there and it had a little catch. And what's nice about this example, it still has the wick pick, so then you can adjust the wick as you're adjusting the flame. It's just a really beautiful, all original piece, and um, at least I'm assuming the wick pick and everything's all original too. But these typically are missing. And this here is, you know, the crook is broken and it's in rough shape, but this is a Pennsylvania Dutch Betty lamp, cast iron, early quarter of the 1800s. So these are typically late 1700s, early 1800s. You do have some signed pieces of these. If you ever find some signed American iron from the 1700s, chances are it's going to be thousands of dollars. So this um, this knob here is brass, and you don't want to overturn it because these tend to break. This here had the heart um, on top that broke too. So you would open it, and you can adjust the wick and everything from there. And you see how there's a little um, hole here in the bottom? This was where it would hold the wick pick. This is a rough example, but it has beautiful patina to it. Here's another example of a Pennsylvania Dutch Betty lamp. I don't know if this is bent like that on purpose or not, but um, you know, these would also open. You can see the latch, how that would turn. Um, you don't want to turn close these too hard, and this one has the heart-shaped motif on there. 
and a beautiful miner's hook. I think this may have been bent in a little bit. And you can see um, that it has the, um, you know, it also came with a wick pick that's uh, missing from my example. When I saw this on eBay at Buy It Now, I asked no questions. I didn't look at the person's rating. I just bought it now. I was like, score. It was an excellent price for this style of lamp, which can be a little more pricey than these rougher examples. Now here is a cast iron Betty lamp. The fact that it has a halberd hook tells me it's not a miner's Betty. And if you notice how it's even decorative, Look, it even had an old Phillips head that looks original, which is kind of interesting because they didn't have Phillips head screwdrivers at the time. And you can see the channel and everything. So this is a nice, unusual, rusty piece. I could do a letter of restoration so I can um, clean the rust a little bit. I don't like using metal brushes on these because they leave little scratches and I hate um, ruining antiques. So I could, you, you know, just... Um, Clean it lightly and coat it in linseed oil or something. This is not really a Betty lamp. Um, I believe it's French. It's a miner's lamp from the 1800s. Now, one thing to note is that these typically, you have a lot of um, restored ones or fake ones from like Portugal, but um, this unscrews. I really never did unscrew this to look on the inside. Anyway, that comes out and you can fill it in, add the wick and screw it back in. Now, the ones people desire more are the ones with like a rooster design on the finial versus just a plain flat one, but this kind is actually scarcer. So um, these are the uh, bay lamps. Oh, and I showed you my cost on here. Um, it wasn't very expensive. I guess I can show you this one, but anyway. Um, so these are the Betty lamps, the miners' Bettys, and regular mining lamp from the 1800s as well. And now we get to a few accessories. This is a simple um, hook used in the hearth of homes back in the fireplaces uh, for the 1700s and early 1800s. And you can also use it to hang the Betty lamp on. And you had something which unfortunately I don't have an example of um, to show you guys, which is a small tremel hook for Betty lamps. And I like the sawtooth design. Um, they basically, a lot of those became really scarce over the years. The fireplace ones are huge and they're not as expensive, ironically, because, well, some examples are if they're European and very decorative versus the simpler American designs. But um, those are just hard to find and I'd like to get the modern blacksmith version when I can. So then you had these, and this is a modern piece by Jerry Darnell, which is basically um, a spike. You spike it into the wall, and then you can hang your lamp on it. So these are basically um, nice uh, hangers for your lamps. Um, then you had, this is just a, I got it from Michael's, like a little pedestal, but the original wooden bases are much more expensive than the typical Betty lamp. They basically, you would sit it there and you can have it sitting on a table. And the original ones, you're lucky to find them for under a grand and they go for a few thousand, sometimes two, three, four. But there are so many fakes because of it, so I would not advise buying those off eBay. Now, before I get into this piece here, I'm gonna talk about this one. I paid a hefty amount of money for this, even though I, just because it was unusual, even though I didn't realize what it was at the time. Now, obviously the base is from an old wagon wheel that's been replaced, you can see, because like I said, they would replace bases uh, years ago. But I learned that these are not really candle holders, they're not really splint holders. And I don't know if this one is bent or it's designed to support a smaller European candle versus a bigger one. But these are something known as candle stub holders or savols. Usually you would have a small pricket that was an accessory attached to, let's say you had a nice pendant candle holder, it had a base with a candle you would have like on the pan, like a little pricket that came out. Um, so to find one dedicated for that is really rare. And to find one that holds two is even rarer. But you see how the metal is fat, it thins out a little bit and it gets fat again. 
you can basically cradle the candle stub in here and, and you can get as much um, light as you can from even the little stubs of candles that no longer fit in the candle cup or a candle socket. So this is an extremely rare and unusual lighting accessory from the 1700s. This one would be typical of the sticking tommies or like little miners candle holders that you would find in mines except the the candle socket would be a little more elaborate than this. This I paid more than I should have for it. I don't believe it is an early original um, piece but it's a nice old um, blacksmith forge one. You can see how this is um, flat so you can hammer the spike into a wall and it would probably you could hammer it this way and use it as a hook also you could hammer it this way and use that as a hook so I'm including it as an accessory even though it was designed as a modern forgery or just a modern version of a sticking tommy um, which which are like miners uh, candlesticks so anyway these are all I have to show you in lighting let us now uh, shift to what is the best book to buy on early American lighting. So now that I've shown you guys um, a few of my uh, pieces and things, I did not, I do not have a large exhaustive collection. I don't have cresses or huge floor lamps. Usually those floor lamps would be about this high. They wouldn't be as tall because people were shorter, but also so you can sit there at your chair and have you know, have them um, illuminating you from a good height. And I don't have any pendant lamps or um, Betty lamp tremels to show you guys or any of the fancier stuff, but hopefully I've given you a good rundown and a little bit of history and identifying the era they came from, if you saw some from the late 1600s, early 1700s, late 1700s, how you can identify the Irish ones, even though, you know, if the rush lights, even though I don't have an example of those, and the Welsh style um, rush lights versus other ones. So now let's get into some books. You have basic books about colonial lighting, but if you flip through them, they're talking about the history, which is good and informative, but they don't really give you a good overview of the different styles and um, trying to determine the age based on the style. You also have other books um, on antique iron and they usually include a section on lighting. Now one of the better books on antique iron is um, it's called Colonial Wrought Iron, the Sorber Collection. And uh, Jim Sorber basically amassed the largest collection of American colonial iron. And it was so huge you know, it was too many for even museums to want to display. So they eventually got auctioned off. And Don Plummer, the author of this book, he basically um, took a lot of the nicer pieces and put them in here. So this has a good section on lighting, but, it gives, but basically it's more like a picture book. Let me actually flip to a section on, on lighting. So it's basically a picture book as opposed to um, giving you good descriptions of when the books were made, etc. So now you have another one, which is also a picture book made by the Rushlight Society called Early Lighting. And um, they have a lot of other things besides just the uh, iron stuff that I like. You know, I like to focus on just the iron stuff. But here's a good snippet from there. And the best book I have found, uh, unfortunately, the one I bought doesn't have a dust cover, but it's called Making Fire and Light in the Home Pre-1820. Did I get the year right? Yep. The author is John Caspell, C-A-S-P-A-L-L. He actually goes through a, um, not, not only, let me go to a section on the iron lighting, which is what I like, um, uh, candlesticks. Here we go. But what's interesting is not only does he give you a good description talking about them, but under the caption of the image, he gives you like what they are. Sometimes he'll say like this one's Welsh. I'll show you my example of a Welsh one. And he says early to mid 18th century or early to mid 1700s. Um, actually on this one, he doesn't mention that it's Welsh, but 
Um, like this one here, um, he does mention down here that it is Welsh, but this is the best, um, this book came actually with a photo of an accessory, which is kind of cool. But anyway, this is the best book I've found on colonial lighting because it does give you a good description, gives you good text if you want to read about them, and gives you nice examples of photo in photos as well as their ages and how you can tell the age stylistically. Now, the reality is these are ba based on the best sources. They're the best estimates on the age range for these items. But because a lot of the blacksmith forged pieces are not signed, it's harder to determine their actual ages. And if you do find a signed piece, they're typically very expensive, as mentioned earlier. Now, what's interesting is a lot of the Roman lamps were, you know, the clay ones were put into molds and the um, different towns and different lamp makers would actually have the location underneath. So you would basically, like you could find lamps from antiquity that are attributed to their makers, but it's a lot harder with colonial iron. Anyway, I hope you found this video quite informative on early iron lighting. And um, don't forget to give me a thumbs up, subscribe, and um, happy collecting if you decide to now venture into a lamp collection. Thanks for watching. Enjoy.